Silas Mukio easily relates to his neighbor Matthias Sendegea, but it took him years to master the calm to shake the same hands that wiped out his entire family 20 years ago. It's a start of the 100 days of mourning for the 1 million people killed during the genocide and like they do every year during the memorial, Matthias accompanies Silas to the Interama Church Memorial, the scene where Matthias and others butchered thousands of people, including Silas's family. Truly speaking, this makes me remember many things. I didn't know this man, but as you can see, he was killed by a machete on his head. It is the same way my dad died. He was only 11 when his family, together with thousands others, sought sanctuary in the house of the Lord, believing it would protect them from marauding killers. But it didn't. Twenty years later, their blood-stained clothes still lie on the pews in this church, while the victims' cracked skulls and bones line the back of the church. Silas, the only surviving member of his family, had to wait for years to know who his family's killer was. Nobody came to say they killed my family. 10th April 1994, thousands of men and women took shelter in this church. This heap of blood-stained clothes belongs to the thousands of children that had come here as well. And while the attackers would use guns and machetes on their parents, for the children they would have their heads smashed on these walls. People should die, but die with dignity. But to take a machete and stab someone... Silas only got to know of his family's killer after the start of the Rwanda Community Courts, known as the Kachacha, set up in 2001 to prosecute perpetrators of the genocide. I have forgiven him. In my heart, he is innocent. It's a path that Rwanda chose to take after the genocide, a long path of bringing warring tribes together. I confessed to what I had done. I participated in the murder, but I was asking for forgiveness. Matthias confessed to have killed 20 people. He was convicted and served a nine-year jail term, after which he was released among hundreds of others following a presidential pardon. And while Rwanda is doing everything to reconcile, they're also determined not to forget its atrocious past. It is the only way to ensure that the genocide does not happen again. Yeah, we remember just to, to hope uh, genocide never again in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. Every day we teach in, at school our children to, to be together and not tribe in Rwanda. We are together now. Rwanda has heavily invested in bringing both perpetrators and their victims to live together, literally. In areas like Mayange in Bugesera, east of Kigali, the government has built houses for the killers and their victims in what they call reconciliation villages. It's where Matthias lives side by side with three families who are victims of his machete. You can't unite people when they are not living together. You can't organize people when they are not living together. You can't even telling people about the economy when even they are not stable in their mind. Kenya has had its fair share of ethnic fights, the worst being the 2007-2008 post-election violence. But reconciliation efforts and the prosecution of perpetrators have been, at best, lukewarm, forcing the ICC to intervene by trying leaders accused of orchestrating the conflict. Rwanda, on the other hand, chose to establish a local mechanism. Across Rwanda, you will find such barazas, communities coming together to discuss the genocide 
effective ways of ensuring that this does not happen again. Esther Kahumbi, Citizen TV, Kigali, Rwanda.